Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to the Responsible Use of Data seminar series organized as part of the Academic Fringe Festival. I'm Juana Inel and today I'm really excited to welcome Laura Arroyo to our seminar series who will talk about the challenge of identifying weak spots in machine learning models due to the data used for training and evaluation. So before we start today's talk, I would like to give a little bit of background about this seminar series on responsible use of data. With these talks, we aim to get a better understanding of what is the current research performed by both academics and practitioners in industry in the area of responsible AI or responsible data science. We look in particular at data because it's a central aspect for training and evaluating AI systems. And we see more and more examples in which the irresponsible use of data and maybe the lack of critical thinking with regard to data leads to inequality, inequity, bias, and even unethical outcomes. Thus, we take a multidisciplinary view to discuss and draw certain guidelines to make the use of data responsible practice. Just a couple of uh, administrative points. I would like to let you know that this talk is being recorded and will be made publicly available on YouTube in a couple of days. So if you don't want to be recorded, uh, please turn off your camera. Uh, you can post your questions in the chat and at the end of Laura's talk, uh, you can either ask the question yourself or I can ask or I can ask it. So without further ado, I would like to welcome our speaker, Laura Arroyo, one more time. We are really excited to have you today as our seminar series speaker. Laura is a research scientist at Google New York, currently working on human label data quality. She is best known for her work on the CrowdTruth crowdsourcing methodology. Throughout her career, Laura was a principal investigator of a large number of research projects, which brought together methods and tools from human computation, linked open data, data science, and human computer interaction with the goal of building hybrid human AI systems for understanding text, images, and videos with humans in the loop. And now I would like to uh, invite Laura to tell us more about these topics. And I'd like to thank her again for joining us. Thank you, Oana, for the introduction. Um, and I'm very glad to present today. I'm really excited about uh, this uh, work uh, that I'm currently doing at uh, Google Research with my uh, team, uh, with members of my team, uh, Likert, uh, where we focus mainly on uh, trying to find uh, creative ways of studying uh, quality of human label data and this data specifically when it's used for AI systems. Um, so let me give a little bit of a historic start my talk with a little bit of history walk uh, of how did how did we what, what was the path of AI until now? So if you think about it in the beginning, it was what we call the AI winter. Uh, these were uh, mainly um, building, focusing on building expert systems in small scale uh, lab experiments. And then in 2011, uh, things started warming up. So one might say we entered the AI spring uh, when uh, IBM Watson um, won against the top contestants of uh, the popular game show Jeopardy. And then a few years later in 2016, uh, AlphaGo uh, won against the greatest player of Go in the world. So this uh, major breakthroughs of, uh, in AI uh, through the power of games opened the possibility for AI to actually be uh, much more useful in our everyday activities and supporting people in real world tasks. And here are some examples uh, like health diagnostics, uh, conversations, weather predictions, and so on. However, um, the state of the art uh, kept on constantly challenging the AI systems um, in, in this endeavor helping, of helping humans by um, exposing numerous examples of un 
unintended behaviors. And this is a short list, uh, and the list is much larger. Uh, and I believe many of you remember uh, when these are the things, at least, that came in the, in the news uh, and uh, draw attention to many people. So uh, here is uh, a little bit of uh, overview of uh, uh, those unintended behaviors. Uh, so this is also the point where uh, uh, really data started becoming uh, into the sort of the focus of our research field. Um, we uh, so rec very recently, Andrew Ng uh, published an, uh, a piece uh, where uh, called Big Data to Good Data, and he was urging the machine learning community to be more data centric rather than model centric. Um, based on the motivation that if the 80% of our work uh, is data is focused on data preparation. So ensuring data quality should be an important work, an important part of every machine learning team. Um, and if data indeed is the compass for AI, data quality and data practices should be essential part of guiding AI away from this kind of unintended uh, behaviors. So, and the idea in this guidance is to really try to make computers see the problems in the data, understand better its natural diversity as well. So, uh, as I started with a little history uh, of uh, AI, uh, let's do the same with data. So, what is the life cycle of data until now? In the beginning, it was all about bootstrapping AI with data. If the data existed, it was good. So we were really happy to have data uh, that we can feed into uh, our experiments. And then we moved uh, to larger data sets. Once we realized the power of data, AI systems became data hungry. So the bigger, the better. So the, that was the main criteria for evaluating the quality or the utility of our data sets. Um, and in 2009, Alan Halevi, Peter Norvik, and Fernando Pereira published the famous article, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Data, which really summarized the success, was a success story of data in AI purely in terms of its volume. Um, however, in a decade, it's all more than a decade now uh, uh, later, the research community has done a lot with the quality, but the quantity, uh, a lot with the quantity, but the quality of the data is still uh, an under-researched uh, topic. So uh, we learned it a little bit the hard way. So before we switched from having larger data sets to having actually better data sets, things didn't get better, but they actually got worse. And this is, again, the same point where the paths of uh, the little history of AI that I showed you and the life cycle data uh, actually cross. In this explosion of unintended uh, behaviors uh, of numerous mainstream AI systems. Um, and so this triggered natural focus into data improvement. So we started looking much more into data. However, there was one problem in this, uh, in the way we looked into the, uh, these data problems. It, we were very reactive and we are still primarily very reactive. We only focus on uh, weaknesses that have already been known or exposed through this kind of unintended behaviors. This year, uh, Nitya Sambasivan published a paper at CHI, which uh, showed uh, a very interesting uh, uh, result, uh, showed the results from an interesting study uh, showing how unknown data errors can cascade into machine learning performance. And no matter how meticulous we are with our metrics, these issues will harm and continue harming unless we start addressing them proactively. And, um, in the meantime, since we shifted our focus to looking at data, we did develop a number of automated techniques 
to focus on these known, uh, known unknowns, uh, which rely primarily on within the model signals. Uh, however, we, the, as Panos and Periotis uh, uh, said in 2016, we can't do it without uh, humans. Uh, humans should always be part of machine learning solutions as they guide the machine learning systems to learn about things that the system don't know yet. And these are exactly the unknown unknowns, which it's our, uh, our human perspective is the only way machines can actually know about the things they don't know uh, that can cause problems. So human reporting became very uh, central focus on uh, trying to identify the unknown unknowns. But as you all know, hum we are not human effort is not scalable or, or not in the way that we applied it. So again, knowing we can't do it without humans, it looks easy, but it's actually harder than, uh, than we think. So, we started looking at uh, ways of applying crowdsourcing to this unknown and known discoveries as a way of scaling up the human effort and also a way of really um, harnessing the human intuition and incentivizing sort of online collaboration between people in their uh, process of discovery. So this was the main motivation behind the, the data challenge that we introduced at the Human Computation Conference last year. Um, and we officially launched it this year in February, uh, which uh, propo proposed a way of uh, crowdsourcing test sets, specifically difficult or adverse test set for machine learning models. And we really like the abbreviation of our system, <laughs> considering that cats are the most entertaining object uh, on uh, online. So as I said, we tried to scale the human effort in the process of detecting unknown unknowns. Uh, we tried to harness this human intuition uh, and creativity, uh, stimulating uh, various ways of people uh, uh, exploring uh, uh, various data sets. Uh, we really wanted to create a, um, a, a space within the challenge where this human creativity uh, and intuition can be in a simulated collaborative environment where people can actually learn from other uh, um, appro the approaches of other participants in this, uh, um, uh, in this challenge. And we wanted to create a sort of uh, rewarding or scoring system that really exhaustively explores a space uh, within uh, a particular benchmark or a, a specific set of models. And the ultimate goal was to generate this seed set of difficult examples that can afterwards be um, explored automatically, uh, extended automatically, through various generative or similarity-based approaches. Uh, as I said, we published the challenge in February this year. Uh, you can read more about it uh, in the blog post, the AI, Google AI blog post that we posted in February. And the main idea of the challenge was uh, to um, provide the proof of concept for this, uh, for, for this uh, methodology, crowdsourcing adverse data sets or crowdsourcing unknown unknowns for machine learning. So we took a data set, uh, which is open image data set. We provided it online. Uh, we scoped it to some subset of it, so because it's pretty large, it's about 9, 9 million uh, images, uh, 20,000 labels, which uh, results in more than 60 million uh, image label pairs. And um, we uh, provided a, a system, a pipeline uh, to uh, participants in which they will be able to submit their findings from this data set uh, and for us to be able to score them against the machine performance. So this is uh, in a sort of bird eye view of how the challenge works. So we identified three groups of uh, actors, the finders, these are the challenge participants, which get rewarded for every uh, uh, new image label pair that they find uh, mislabeled by a machine. 
uh, verifiers that are actually, uh, these are internal raters that verify, find their submissions. And uh, at the end, we have the machines, which are represented by their machine scores for every uh, image label pair submitted by the finders. Uh, the machines uh, in this case are um, uh, image classification models from the ICA model family. Uh, and we have created a sort of aggregated um, aggregated score from a number of models in order to compare an average machine performance uh, against uh, the average uh, human verified um, scores. Uh, as I said, uh, we provided a target uh, set of images and a target uh, set of labels, um, uh, which were they were provided on the challenge website, and uh, participants were able to access uh, uh, about uh, 1.3 million images uh, for a set of 24 target labels. Uh, the, we made the choice for only 24 labels uh, because, as I said, the open image data set is a very large data set with more than 20,000 uh, um, label classes. And we wanted to see whether if scoping it and focusing it on a smaller subset of classes, uh, we can actually achieve a, a larger concentration of uh, errors uh, within the same um, uh, subdomain. So this was the, the target uh, data set. That's how a submission by a participant looks like. Um, this is a, a screenshot uh, for four images for a label muffin. This is an example of one of our target labels. Uh, so uh, participants uh, can uh, find search for images for any of the 24 labels. In this case, uh, let's pretend we found uh, four images for the label muffin, and um, uh, we submit a CSV file which contains the image ID for each of those four images, the label ID uh, for muffin, and some rationale of how um, uh, these images were discovered or what is potentially the error uh, in uh, the image labeling. Uh, once you submit your CSV file, it becomes uh, available on the website and it's visible to all the registered uh, users. And this was one of the, the uh, intentions or the rationales behind the challenge is to simulate uh, collaboration and sort of refining common sense across uh, various uh, participants uh, by inspecting each other's submissions and figuring out how what you learn from other people's submissions you can use in order to improve your own discovery method. Uh, so we gathered in total about 14,000 submissions, which was uh, we considered uh, uh, quite successful. Uh, bear in mind, this was meant to be a proof of concept, uh, the first pilot uh, for this kind of data challenge with humans in the loop. Uh, so. Uh, the intention was really to understand what works and what didn't work in the process of engaging the research community and uh, what would be the scale of the resulted uh, images. And 14,000 submissions from 10 participants uh, was a, a quite nice uh, engagement uh, across various academic and industrial uh, um, organizations and nicely spread around the world uh, in many continents. Um, so we were glad to see the, these final statistics there. Uh, so from just a little bit to, uh, to, the, to tell you a little bit of how this data looked like, uh, from the 14,000 submissions, about 12,000 were actually valid submissions. And valid submissions would be uh, considered if they are indeed image label pairs from the open image ID. So anything that was submitted which was not a valid uh, image ID or valid uh, uh, label was uh, um, uh, discarded. Uh, and also valid submissions were non-duplicate submissions. Um, this would uh, be, uh, they were, um, uh, their participants can submit the same image level uh, label pair uh, as many times as they want, 
Uh, however, it uh, once it's submitted the uh, first time, any any uh, uh, follow-up attempt of submitting it will make it an invalid submission. Will be invalid uh, for the submission. So we had about uh, uh, 1,500 um, sort of within users duplicated, and about another uh, uh, less than a thousand um, uh, submissions that were duplicated across the users. So this was quite nice. Uh, that uh, actually submissions across different users were didn't have a high duplication rate and interesting also to see is that we actually got submissions for almost for almost 200 uh, labels even though we restricted the challenge to only 24 labels some participants were submitting uh, images from outside of uh, uh, outside out of the scope of the challenge uh, and those are also not considered valid submissions. Uh, however, uh, they were very interesting submissions for different labels, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so, in order to participate in the challenge, you had to register on our website. You were given an initial quota of 1,000 um, uh, images, uh, image label pairs to submit. Again, this, well, this restriction was placed there in order to make sure we don't receive uh, a large amount of spam uh, submissions as the challenge was open uh, on the web. Um, you were allowed to submit multiple times. The intention was that once the challenge is open, it runs for four months and people will be able to submit on a continuous, uh, 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 continuous basis throughout uh, those uh, three months. Unfortunately, this wasn't what we experienced, uh, just like with any other paper deadline or project uh, proposal deadline, we know everything happens in the last week or even the last days before the deadline approaches. So we received uh, two thirds of all the submissions in the last four days of the challenge before the challenge closed down, which was a good stress test for us uh, uh, on uh, the positive side. So let's have a look at some of the things that the finders actually discover. Um, in overall, these were really interesting uh, uh, discoveries. Uh, we learned uh, a lot about the image label space uh, from them. You can see a little distribution of uh, over the 24 labels. Uh, so it's a long tail distribution. Uh, many uh, labels, uh, so few labels got a lot of attention. Most of them were very uh, object oriented, so bird, lipstick, chopsticks, canoe. Uh, and the ones that were more difficult were the ones that related to roles or professions. Uh, and they're more difficult because not they have less visual features to be uh, easily identified, both for humans and for machines, actually. Um, so, the goal of the, the challenge was to identify difficult examples for machine learning models. Uh, and uh, these difficult examples, we cluster in two main groups, uh, the false negatives and the false positives of the model. Uh, the false negatives are the image label pair, the images for which the specific label is missed um, uh, by the machine. And the false positive is that when for a specific image, the, the label uh, that is given is actually wrongly identified. And so those are the two types of uh, discoveries that the finders were making. And here are some uh, observation on the first, uh, so initial observations on the results. So we found that uh, uh, very many examples um, uh, could be uh, clustered uh, in sort of the class of errors of similar shapes and failing to recognize context. Uh, so, the, for example, um, we've, there were examples of uh, stairs which were recognized as chopsticks or rack of books recognized as chopsticks, even a pack of cigarettes. Uh, so these are all examples that really fail to recognize a context where Typically, you don't find chopsticks uh, close to stairs or on a bookshelf or even close to cigarette uh, uh, places where cigarette boxes uh, can be uh, present. Uh, and many of those actually through weird uh, camera angles 
would look like chopsticks uh, uh, and could be hallucinated to be chopsticks by machines uh, easily. Uh, and another uh, another example was similar shape without uh, the context. So we uh, uh, saw examples where the object which is identified by the label is present uh, in the image, but there is no additional context around it, either in a blank uh, background or uh, a, a unidentifiable uh, background. Uh, the co context is missing. When the context is missing, this object often uh, can be uh, mislabeled by the machine. So the combination, the role of context appeared to be a big role, play a big role in discovering unknown unknowns. And here are some examples uh, for shapes. Uh, so bagel, uh, muffin, um, uh, donuts mixed as bagels, uh, um, uh, pretzels mixed as bagels, uh, cupcakes mixed as muffins, bullets mixed as lipsticks, uh, uh, which was uh, an interesting uh, thing to see. So these are all objects which somehow through their similarity shape get recognized as a different uh, label. Uh, and so on, we have uh, other uh, groups of, um, uh, of errors. Uh, for example, uh, again, context, as I said, played a big role. Uh, we uh, figure, uh, uh, found out that in order to uh, successfully recognize chopsticks, uh, presence of Asian food uh, plays a big role. So almost every time, so this was a very big source of uh, false positives, uh, because as soon as there was a table with Asian food, chopsticks would be uh, recognized as being uh, a, a part of the image. Uh, another interesting group of uh, errors were uh, mixing roles based on con context. So if you see uh, uh, a person uh, or a mother or a father uh, cooking in, in a kitchen, so kitchen context would uh, trigger chef. Um, a student drawing on a whiteboard will trigger teacher label. A person wearing a lab tech uh, coat, a white coat, would be considered as a physician, and so on and so on. Um, and uh, the, the low confidence when context is ab absent, I already told you in the previous one. Uh, here are the examples of the book, the rack of books, uh, and um, a, book, uh, a box of uh, cigarettes, uh, matches, uh, pencils, straws, and pasta, all falsely recognized as uh, chopsticks. Uh, either be, be, because of lack of context, as you can see, they have very little context uh, next to the objects. Uh, also, the playing with zooming in and zooming out uh, um, works towards this as well, or uh, the shot angle. Uh, and in combination with similar shape, uh, these were typical examples of uh, machines getting it wrong. And another uh, class of errors which was interesting to observe were the ontological uh, errors. Um, uh, for example, a machine would recognize in a picture, will recognize a bird, but will not say it was actually a duck. Uh, will recognize it as a bird, but will not say it's an animal. Um, this would be sort of the complementary uh, labels uh, based on sort of uh, uh, child-parent uh, relationship, but if you look at, uh, for example, exclusive categories, ontologically exclusive ca categories for the same image, we found examples where a porcupine is recognized and also recognized as a bird or a mouse and a porcupine where you would expect ontologically if one of them is recognized, the other one should not be a high confidence label. Um, and um, here are some more examples uh, of a group of uh, problems that we had uh, with respect to lack of common sense. We noticed that lipstick, very often, just the mere presence of lips was triggering uh, uh, lipstick uh, uh, labeling. Uh, and when these were pictures of uh, children, um, uh, we realized that there is uh, the common sense, the fact that there is a very low probability of children wearing lipstick was not taken in consideration in order to prevent this 
appearance. And the other uh, examples of common sense is that you don't really find hats on chopsticks. Uh, however, this uh, coat rack that looks like chopsticks in a very zoomed in image uh, uh, ignores uh, the fact that there's also a hat on it. You don't typically pile things on uh, sort of use chopsticks as skewers. Uh, many skewers in this uh, view were um, uh, recognized as chopsticks. Chopsticks was a really interesting <laughs> set of examples. I was even thinking of making the title of this uh, uh, presentation everything you want, ever wanted to know about chopsticks. Um, uh, it was a high, large category of uh, um, error detected during the challenge. And so on. So there are uh, other other classes of uh, errors uh, when, and you can see that most of them uh, really the the conditional presence of another object or another setting uh, or part of the context that triggers uh, many labels to be many images to be mislabeled. And a last category was the category of uh, depictions, cartoons, sketches, or uh, depictions of um, birds or animals as toys, uh, or people as statues. Uh, even for humans, this is not really clear. Do we consider those being right? Uh, when you see a statue of a bird, is this actually a bird, or is it a mistake? Uh, so we uh, observed a lot of uh, um, ambiguity there, also disagreement among the human raters, not being able to agree whether a statue of a bird is a bird uh, or not. So uh, talking about human raters, so the next step after submitting, were, uh, we were sending all uh, in real time um, uh, all the submissions to internal raters. Everything was rated by five uh, uh, raters on uh, one of our internal platforms. Uh, this is uh, the interface they used. Uh, they had a very simple um, uh, verification interface for the label. In this case, it's bird. Yes, it's a bird. No, it's not a bird or unable to tell. And uh, we um, one thing that we uh, found out uh, by looking at the results is that verifiers were not, um, they were, they, they were, uh, they had, similarly as machines, they also had problems uh, verifying uh, with high agreement, uh, most of the, not most, but uh, some of the submissions. As those were typically the difficult examples, they will be difficult for machines. One of our hypotheses that was that they would be easier for humans to identify, but really hard for machines. However, we found out that not all of them uh, are as easy for humans to agree on, reliably agree on as well. Um, and we found out that the raters themselves can be inconsistent. Uh, we uh, saw various uh, versions of uh, with slight variation of the same image being labeled uh, in a different way. So here, these are drumsticks. Uh, in this case, uh, raters say unable to tell whether this is chopsticks. And in this, when they are also drumsticks, they say uh, this is not chopsticks. Uh, this is the same image from a different angle. In one case, raters say that they cannot tell whether this is chopsticks, and in another case, they say it is, it's not chopsticks, and so on. So we notice this kind of uh, inconsistent behavior for some of uh, the images that were rated. Um, and uh, explicit errors for things that are obviously, uh, so this was uh, interesting, this image of bullets where actually it does have the brand name for the bullet producer. The rater said that they were not able to tell whether this is lipstick or not. Uh, and it does look like lipstick, but it does have signals in the background for raters to uh, be able to verify. Um, or crostini or skewers and so on, clearly much easier for humans to actually see them. They were erroneously verified uh, um, by the raters. So it's a difficult thing to actually use humans in the loop 
in a real uh, real time uh, annotation in such a challenge. So the humans in the loop were the main, the, the big foundation for issuing this kind of challenge. Uh, and uh, it wasn't an easy, it wasn't as easy as straightforward as we planned it to be. Um, it really it did require a lot of continuous engagement to keep sourcing uh, participants uh, and keep uh, uh, sort of surfacing it on online as an activity for participants to uh, join. Uh, the real-time feedback was uh, uh, missing. Uh, most people are used to get, uh, whenever they submit something, to get a relatively quickly uh, feedback about whether they scored or not. In this case, because we were dependent on human raters, it was uh, uh, difficult to provide real-time feedback. So we tried to do within uh, 24 hours to 48 hours uh, to provide. Uh, but depending on the submissions, and as I uh, uh, showed you, depending on the agreement between the raters, some cases were more difficult uh, and easier uh, or more difficult to submit um, uh, fast feedback on them. It wasn't uh, easy and trivial to derive verifier score on this uh, um, uh, because of the lack of agreement uh, on a um, uh, large chunk of cases. So we had experimented uh, after the closing of the challenge, we had experimented with number of um, verifier score mechanisms to derive a verifier score in order to see what is the most reliable one that would uh, uh, actually propagate uh, fairly across uh, different participants. Um, and uh, similarly to the real-time feedback, maintaining uh, a public leaderboard uh, which is continuously up to date was a challenging thing within uh, the challenge. And the main thing uh, I just wanted to say the main thing as a part of this challenge was we really wanted to derive a value uh, for every example to understand how some examples are more valuable or more harmful um, uh, to, uh, to the models. Uh, and the idea of classifying the errors uh, the way I showed you before was our attempt to uh, on the way to deriving values for each example. Um, so, um, I would like to so quickly uh, walk you through the final step of this pipeline. So, once we have the, the human scores uh, and the machine scores, we do compare them. And just to iterate again, wh what is the thing that we looked at? If you remember, we look at the false positives and false negatives. So false positives would be when the machine says, yes, there is donut in this image, and the human says, no, there is no uh, donut. So the human verification results is uh, no for this label, and the machine score says yes. So this is a typical disagreement, which uh, will provide a score for the participant who submitted this image. For the same image, in this case, you can also take another label and uh, this would be the false negative uh, in this case when the, the human raters uh, identify, yes, there are bagels in this image, uh, however, the machine fails to recognize them. So this would be the two cases in which a participant submitting an image label pair of either kind will get a score. Uh, you will not get a score when machines and raters agree on the same image. Uh, and this is uh, another example of a false positive. Um, and there are a bunch of looking at the time. I don't know whether I have uh, uh, sufficient time. Yeah, we have enough time. Okay. So I just wanted to give you a little bit more of the rationale um, of behind the way we, we scheduled. Uh, so as I said, we um, gave uh, each participant initial quota of thousand images. Uh, they so this means they could submit image label pairs up to thousand image label pairs in one go. However, if they did score on uh, on some of those uh, submitted image label pairs, they will get an additional bonus quota. So uh, the idea for this was we wanted to 
stimulate the continuous engagement. Uh, we wanted to stimulate people actually trying out the system and seeing what scores and how it scores and using this as a refining of their, uh, um, their discovery model. And as I said in the beginning, we uh, wanted to uh, limit the possibility of having spam submissions. Um, so that was the initial thousand image, which actually doesn't mean that you can only submit up to thousand. If you submit thousand and you don't score a single uh, image label pair, this would be the, your final submission. Uh, but if you keep submitting uh, uh, image label pairs that get scored, you will continuously get more uh, uh, quota for submitting uh, and like this in, increase your chances of winning ultimately the challenge. And um, this was uh, the team. Uh, we had a lot of people uh, participating and helping us uh, in um, developing the system, uh, testing the system, uh, and uh, helping us maintain uh, all the, the, the work to, uh, throughout the challenge for those four months. And we did uh, this in collaboration with our colleagues Ken Burke and Shahab Kamali from the image classification team, uh, where uh, the, the, the type of task and the challenge we defined was actually aligned with the problems they have observed uh, previously in their models. Um, and uh, just to tell you who we are, this is our Likert team, Praveen, Ka, Devi, and myself. Uh, and if you're interested in um, uh, more in data quality and other work that we do in data quality, uh, join the data excellence mailing list that we are maintaining uh, that currently has about 200 people. Um, and we organize workshops throughout the year, different conferences where we discuss um, data excellence uh, uh, ways of achieving data excellence for human label data. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much, Laura. It was such an interesting presentation and it's good to know about the challenge and how it works. And we are also happy to know that you're going to continue working on it. Yes, um, this was just uh, the first edition, the pilot, the proof of concept. Hopefully it proved more useful than less useful. So we'll continue working. So far, that's how it looks. Uh, before we get questions from the public, uh, I would like to ask you a little bit about um, some of the, the labels that you mentioned. So if I remember correctly, you had the label nurse in, in the data set. And mm -hmm. um, I'm curious whether the images that were used um, or if the participants found any, any human biases in, in the images. Uh, that were annotated. For example, if you see a woman in a white scrub, you are more likely to label it as a nurse uh, than as a doctor. And for men, uh, the other way around. Uh, so this is already a known issue for <clears throat> many uh, machine learning um, uh, image classification models, uh, the gender bias. Uh, unfortunately, in this uh, in this challenge, uh, we nurse was one of the smallest uh, submitted categories. Uh, you, if you saw in the the long tail graph that I showed, it was the almost the last uh, uh, label. So we got very few submissions, and they were all context um, sort of role confusion based on context. As I said, anybody who wears a lab coat was identified either as a physician. So physician and nurse were constantly mixed. So you might think actually it wasn't a gender bias because if physician has the male gender typically as we know and nurse has a female gender, in this case those were very intermixed uh, here as, uh, as errors. But we didn't have sufficient, uh, we had only a few submissions in order to draw a uh, large bias conclusions on them. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, I would also like to know whether uh, you have any insights on how to actually deal with uh, the disagreement between 
the annotators, like the raters, the, the people that verify the data. And uh, if there is a way to integrate these in the systems, in the, which systems do you mean? Uh, so when we build machine learning models, the fact that people disagree. Yeah, this was a big, uh, big discussion. We spend a lot of time actually reviewing various um, approaches to uh, create an aggregate human score from the five raters, so from majority vote to mean uh, to uh, some kind of uh, various types of consensus. And ultimately, we actually took an approach which is very close to crowd truth. Um, so we, um, uh, and it was uh, comparing across uh, all, uh, multiple of those seemed most uh, intuitive uh, to um, preserve the ambiguity of the rater. So we sort of had a weighted vector of the, um, of the three a vector of three of length of three yes no and unable to tell for each label um, and we weighted it based on the number of uh, votes we got for each uh, uh, for each of those categories and also the total number of votes because we had five raters but we actually did get more than five ratings uh, this is how the system works sometimes uh, because of verification some image each label pair might go actually through multiple rounds of uh, verifications. So depending on the number, we would weight it on the number of total votes we got. Um, and uh, uh, in this case, we actually managed to consider the uh, unsure as part of the equation. Because before, if you would take a majority vote, unsure was very difficult. So you can't compare unsure to a binary machine score. Uh, so uh, we either had to ignore unsure, we experimented with not counting unsure, but only counting the yes and no, having unsure being uh, fractional in yes and no, and the, this kind of vector representation, which was basically ultimately trying to, predict, to create a, a probability rather than a score. So we, using the vector representation of the rater answers allowed us to create the probability for this to be in alignment with the machine uh, or uh, in agreement with the machine. Thank you. Uh, if anybody has a question, you can raise your hand or just unmute and ask the question yourself. Yes. Yeah, I think. Yes. Hi, hi, Laura. Thanks for the for the great talk. Um, so we were also participating in this uh, challenge, right? And and uh, um, uh, following on the on the human bias topic, yeah? um, we were also using crowds to identify unknown unknowns. And one thing that we find is that it seems that human perception of uh, what what are uh, what images are, are hard for the machines or what, what images are atypical, right? Human perception of atypicality seems also to be very much bounded by our sites. For example, uh, we were annotating a lot this open image data set. We, in the beginning, we, we saw a lot of uh, those images with tiny birds right? in the sky or on the, uh, somewhere, right? And then we, in the beginning, we were thinking, hey, this must be hard for the machine because the birds are so small, right? But then after we annotate more, we find, okay, this is not really uh, rare uh, uh, images. There are a lot of images where, you know, we have those uh, tiny birds. So I wonder if you have find this to be a, uh, 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 well, typical <laughs> issue with, uh, with humans uh, uh, annota uh, annotations of uh, what should be uh, unknown unknowns and, and how, and if it really turns out that the machines can do well on this kind of uh, images? Yeah, so this is a very nice question. And uh, uh, so the humans are able to more or less reliably identify what's in the image. They might not agree. So if you ask multiple people, they might have disagreement. But one thing that is missing for us as humans is that we have no idea how popular this is or not. 
So we don't have an intuition whether this is a, um, a rare image or a very common image. We might have a little bit of sense. Uh, I mean, cigarettes as uh, chopsticks is, uh, we might sort of have a hypothesis. This is not a very often one, but actually you don't know uh, unless you sort of maybe search for it. So we don't have a natural intuition for this. Uh, and I think it's, uh, this challenge is mainly sort of meant to try to trigger this kind of initial human intuitions and see whether they ver they are verified or not. And the idea of this continuous submission was to try to refine your initial hypothesis through understanding whether this was indeed, because the machine ultimately, most of the ones that had the little birds were no problems for machines because there are tons of those in training data, so they're not rare. Um, <clears throat> but as you say, it's difficult for humans to know this a priori. So participating in a challenge like this in an iterative way would actually allow, allow you to understand, allow you to understand, okay, this looked like a really a difficult problem, but obviously it's not. So you can use it as a refining of the strategy um, and sort of creating a heuristic for popularity based on the scores. Seems that this is also a great topic to investigate how humans might uh, adapt their views uh, after seeing more data and perhaps also through more uh, discussions with other participants as well. Like, okay, humans resolve each other's uh, unknown unknowns by, uh, uh, by uh, uh, engaging with the others. And don't forget, we have two sets of humans. We have researchers uh, like yourself who participate and have a much more um, sort of uh, well-constructed hypothesis or idea of uh, what would might work or not. And then this gets kind of verified by raters whose job they're trained to verify, but they verify multiple things and multiple different types of tasks. So they're not necessarily always um, reliable in the sense that, and I'm not saying that they are not reliable, but their results are not necessarily agreeable uh, when there is too much ambiguity present. And if those hypotheses bring uh, a lot of ambiguity, we would, uh, we should expect to see more disagreement on those raters. So it is a kind of refining cycle from researcher point of view to what the insights we gather from the uh, verifiers, then when we get the feedback from machines, and this is the entire refining cycle, which I find uh, fascinating to actually continue thinking of how to uh, make it more efficient and uh, more effective ultimately. Yeah, this is very much uh, um, uh, related to this human AI interaction uh, topic, right? Uh, or yeah. Collaboration. Yeah, collaboration. Okay, thanks a lot for uh, sharing the thoughts. Thank you. Anybody else would like to ask a question? So I can, uh, I would like to ask one more question. And uh, this is, uh, yeah, I'm just curious if you have any intuition on um, the difference is between uh, some classes that you used in the challenge, right? Because you had the birds and everybody focused on birds, or actually not everybody, but most of people. And then uh, we had labels such as uh, related to events or related to, um, uh, you said, the roles, people, roles. Uh, why? I mean, I, I have this impression that uh, us as researchers, we also focused on less ambiguous cases because they're easier to understand. So I have a hypothesis. I, I can't say anything <laughs> with uh, any certainty, but my hypothesis is that in order to, so there are two aspects of the challenge. It's a challenge, so you earn score, so you want to win. Objects are easy, winner birds, canoes, muffins, and so on. These are, uh, if you manage to find a way, uh, uh, points in which machines uh, get it wrong, 
this is a very quick win. Uh, so it does actually create a lot of scale and which is not bad because even though we think bird and muffin is a very easy concept, we have find out, found out examples which are not very trivial. So it actually does enlarge and diversify what we already know about these object-oriented uh, labels. On the other hand, uh, the, so there are other classes of, there were uh, concepts like smile or selfie. There were professions like uh, construction worker, nurse, uh, um, and then there were sports, athletes as a role, and American football as a type of sport. And all of those were extremely interesting because they're not uh, so many of those, um, uh, and they were events, Thanksgiving and uh, graduation ceremony. So uh, most of Thanksgiving and graduation ceremony, machines are getting them wrong. And uh, because they have no visual cues. It's very difficult to actually say. So anything that, or uh, uh, there was also a funeral, another event. So everything that was uh, pictures of cemeteries were always funerals. Pictures of any kind of official military thing was uh, mixed either um, for a graduation ceremony because there's a lot of flags and people dressed in nice uniforms. Um, and then uh, Thanksgiving is, also, it's a concept. It's like smile or selfie. It's very difficult to capture the visual cues for it. So anything that had a large table with a big dish was uh, uh, was uh, <laughs> considered Thanksgiving. So there, those were, I think, difficult for people to make a hypothesis. So those are actually, I think, were very interesting. If we would be successful to do this iterative, for participants to learn, hey, these are the biases we are getting here. These are the biases in terms of context. If a context of a table with a large uh, uh, dish in the middle is present, it will always be so. If you find all of those images, the chance that they will be mistaken for Thanksgiving will be high. Uh, if cemeteries as well. So I think they were less possibly because they were discovered later in the challenge and it was was too late already to keep submitting uh, as the deadline came. Uh, and sort of this kind of bootstrapping the challenge started with easy ones uh, because this, this they were very easy and intuitive to uh, recognize. Yeah, indeed, they are more difficult. And I think this is could be also a problem of the way the data is annotated because we tend to provide one label for an image, while I think there are cases where more granular labels can be provided, more explanatory labels, actually. Yeah, I mean, in this case, uh, it, this would not be a conflict because each image label pair in the open image dataset is labeled with all of the 20,000 label classes. So they are multiple labels. I don't think it's a, it's a single label problem. I, I think it's really just a, sort of this continuous feedback, which would have been nice if we were able to actually provide this continuous and more detailed feedback. But as, as I told you, humans are not scalable. So we were not able to do this uh, in this near to real time. Uh, but if the challenge would be able to run in this uh, case, I think uh, it could also be now that we know we can basically focus it on just a single label until we exhaust it and then take another one and until we exhaust it. So this would be sort of drilling vertically in the space might be more efficient uh, for people uh, ultimately to discover all possible failure modes. Yeah, indeed. Laura, once again, thank you very much for the presentation and for all the insights that you shared with us. And in the interest of time, I think we will stop here. Thank, thank you very much for inviting me. Have a good day, everyone. You too. Goodbye. Have a nice day.